Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to God's House on the 20th Sunday of the season of Pentecost. In our worship service this morning, we're going to take a look at, a close look at the invitation that God extends to us to come to his wedding feast. What a shame it is when people reject that invitation, but what a joy it is when people accept it by faith in Christ Jesus. We'll be using the service folder, you can do that, or you can watch the screens as we go through the worship service this morning. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins, and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature, and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment, both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, gave for my sins, with his innocent suffering and death. Father in heaven has been merciful to us. He sent his only Son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atonement sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ, and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father and the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace we love and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. For this holy house, and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Lord, have mercy. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. Amen. Best of meats and the finest of wines. 
On this mountain he will destroy the shroud that enfolds all peoples, the sheep that covers all nations. He will swallow up death forever. The Sovereign Lord will wipe away the tears from all faces. He will remove his people's disgrace from all the earth. The Lord has spoken. In that day they will say, Surely this is our God. We trusted in him, and he saved us. This is the Lord. We trusted in him. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Our song this morning, Psalm 84. We will sing the song together. Filled with guests. 
when the king came in to see the guests, to the guests, he noticed a the man there who was not wearing wedding clothes. He asked, how did you get in here without wedding clothes? The man was speechless. Then the king told his attendants, tie him hand and foot and throw him outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are invited, but few are chosen. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise be to you, O Christ. You sing the next hymn.
what we have done in the past is probably not going to work this year as far as where we're going to celebrate it. So she asked, should I invite your parents? Should I invite my mom? Should we do it ourselves? What should we do for Thanksgiving? And I replied by I, I, I saying what every smart husband should. <laughs> You've got it under control. You, you know what to do. I'm going to trust whatever you decide in the end. And, and, and so that was it. But it got me thinking about Thanksgiving. I, I love Thanksgiving. It's one of my favorite holidays outside of the church year holidays. I love the fact that you can start Thanksgiving on Thanksgiving Eve or Thanksgiving Day by coming to God's house, getting together with your family and believers, and just a festival worship service with hymns that are nice and loud. Everybody knows the hymns. Now thank we all our God. Come, ye thankful people, come. We gather together to ask the Lord's blessings. Go, my children, with my blessing. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Those are the standards, some that we sing on Thanksgiving, but those are all beautiful, beautiful hymns. We're reminded of the huge amount of blessings that God has showered on us every day of this past year. And then you go home. And, and then you gather with family and friends. And some of those family you probably have not seen for some time. So you get a chance to catch up. And, and, and you get a chance to get to know your family and your friends a little bit more. What's going on in their lives. And you enjoy that part of Thanksgiving too. But then supper comes or lunch comes, your dinner comes. And, and, and that's a feast, remember. It's a once a year feast that you don't get any other time of the year. And, and traditional Thanksgiving fair that I'll, I've always experienced, you got the turkey, you got the stuffing, you got the mashed potatoes, you got the gravy, you got the cranberries that somebody reminded me because I forgot about them on Thursday evening. You, you've got green bean casserole, you've got maybe some corn, squash, maybe, maybe not, that doesn't make any there. Nice hot butter rolls, a nice glass of wine, probably. Pumpkin pie that round it all out. And, and you've got a feast that you look forward to. And, and I hope everybody looks forward to that because that's what traditional fair is. Maybe it's not tradition in your own home. Maybe your menu is a little bit different. But I'm guessing that you do look forward to it, do you not? And then you hear the gospel for this morning. And you are treated to another feast that, that Isaiah paints for our eyes in the Old Testament reading and how Jesus talks about it in the, in the parable of this wedding banquet that is thrown by the king. And, and, and you're transported to this beautiful, beautiful feast that God has prepared for all of us. This is a banquet. And, and it's not prepared by mom or grandma or, or whoever else that does it in your family. It's God himself. And he pulls out all the stops. And he makes everything perfect. There is nothing burned. There is nothing undercooked. He's serving you the best of wines, the best cuts of meat. It's like when I was a kid, I used to love, I thought when you went to the... When you went to the all-you-can-eat buffet, that's like as close to heaven as you possibly can get. All-you-can-eat buffet. Only this is not just like your run-of-the-mill food that, that they just crank out and they push out a bunch of food just so that people can eat as much as they want. This is an all-you-can-eat buffet at the best restaurant that you have ever been at. And it's free. And the company is better than you could ever expect. And the atmosphere is better than any atmosphere that you have ever imagined in your life. Who in their right minds would ever reject an invitation like that? Why, why would anybody reject God's invitation to that kind of a meal, to that kind of a wedding feast? That, that's the question that, that, that kind of bothers us and is before us this morning. Who would reject God's wedding feast? Here, here's the parable. A king, and so that right off tells you that he spares no expense because he has everything at his disposal. He has all the amount of money that he could possibly need. So he's going to celebrate his son's wedding like no son has ever experienced a wedding before. And, and parents do that, don't they? 
They, they want the best for their children, so they go all out. They might even go farther than they should to celebrate this special occasion. So this is what the king is doing for his son's wedding banquet. Everything is now ready. Everything is perfect. Everything is ready except the guests have not arrived yet. So now since everything is ready, the king sends out his servants and says, knock on the doors and tell the people that have been invited, it's time. It's time to come and enjoy this feast that I have prepared for you. And so they do. They go and they start knocking on the doors and the people start saying, no, no, thanks, but no thanks. I, I, I know I was invited. I don't really feel like coming. The king sends out more servants. He says, knock on the doors again. Tell them that they come, that they need to come because everything is ready. And, and, and the people that have been invited, they say, you know what, I've got a lot of work to do. It's just a bad time for me. It's harvest time. Um, I bought some new cattle or oxen. That's what the, the Gospel of Luke parable reminds us of. Any excuse that they could come up with, they came up with. And they said, thank you, but no thank you. We don't feel like dressing up. We don't feel like coming to a banquet tonight. So the king sends out more servants. And these servants, the people that responded to the initial wedding response and said, yes, I'll come. These ones take the servants and they mistreat them. And not only did they mistreat them, but they actually murdered the king's servants because they dared to knock on the door and invite them to the feast. Who would ever do something like that? Who could imagine that that's the way that you would treat servants who were just there to invite you to something that you should, by rights, want to be at? But yet that's exactly what the servants were up against. The people that had been invited, Jesus later says, they did not deserve to come because of how they treated the king's servants. They, they murdered them. Now, now we might think that what happens next is a little bit over the top because the king was enraged at how his servants were treated and how the people rejected the invitation. So he sends his armies to the people that rejected the invitation and he massacres them. He levels them, he destroys the city that they live in, and, and we might be tempted to think, well, God is, boy, he's a terrible, terrible tyrant for doing something like that. This, this, this wedding father, the father of the groom, how could he do something like that? Talk about a tyrannical man. But think of it this way, I've heard it described in this way. Think of it this way that the United States is trying to settle some, some bad blood between our country and their country. So we send a delegation, say 20 diplomats, and we send them to this particular country to try to broker some peace between our country and their country. And the people get off the plane. As soon as they get off the plane, the people from the foreign country, they blindfold all 20 of them. They cuff their hands, and they lead them only to be executed. All of them are brought to the death. What would you say then? Justice, right? This is like 911. This is like, I can't believe that's what they did to our country. Justice needs to be done to the people that did this. That's what the king was doing. He was only being just in his treatment of those particular people. What kind of a king would let the murder of his own diplomats go unpunished? No, you're, you're, you're calling for justice. The surprising thing in this whole story is not how the king reacted. The most surprising thing in this whole story is why did the people just come in the first place? When they knew what they were coming to, and when they knew what that invitation entailed, they, they, they heard about this festive meal that had been planned. They knew what they were going to get. Why would anybody in their right minds reject that kind of an invitation? That boggles the mind, does it? doesn't it? It's irrational, it's illogical. The only thing that you can chalk it up to is what we talked about last time, last Sunday. Remember the parable of the vineyard? I think it was last Sunday. 
when the vineyard owner sent his son to gather some of the first fruits of the vineyard, and what did the tenants do to his son? They saw him coming down the road, and they said, there's the king's son, he's the heir. If we kill him, we'll get the vineyard. What were they thinking? They thought that they could actually get the vineyard if they killed the king's son, the, the, the man who owned everything, his son? No, they weren't thinking straight, because... That man had all of the defensive and offensive resources at his hands. He could have just destroyed those people. They weren't thinking. But again, I asked the same question as last week. When you sin, are you thinking straight? Are you thinking logically and rationally? Or do sometimes our minds get a little bit clouded because we're trying to figure out how to lie, how to cover up our tracks, how to do this because of our sins. Sin makes us do dumb things. Always. That's the only thing that you can chalk this up to. That sin made these people, their sinful nature says, I don't want the king's invitation. Anyways, back, back to the parable. The king is not now not deterred by the fact that everybody has rejected his invitation. He's still got a banquet hall of empty chairs and lots of food. So he sends out his servants for another round. And he says, this time, don't go to the people that have been invited. <clears throat> go to the people that are on the street corners. Go to the bad parts of town. Go to the people that are good and bad in your estimation. Go to everybody. Don't leave anybody out that you see. Offer them an invitation to the banquet. And so the servants do that. And they go out and they offer the invitation to all. And many, many people fill the banquet hall, and they're having a good time. They're eating, and they're drinking, and they're having just a beautiful, wonderful time at this son's wedding banquet. But then the king spies somebody in the back of the room, and he's kind of shabbily dressed. Have you ever been someplace where you think, boy, that's not very appropriate for the situation? They're not dressed appropriately. It was almost an insult that he would have come in these clothes. And the king approaches this man and he says, Friend, how did you get in here without any wedding clothes? And the assumption is made that, that since these people were, were given an invitation off the street, the king would have supplied them wedding clothes. So when they got to the banquet hall, the king would have supplied a suit or a dress or something that was appropriate for that particular occasion. And the man answered him, he was speechless. He couldn't answer him. What was the implication? He thought that he could get there on his own. He thought he could come on his own. It was an insult to the king the way that he was dressed. It was inappropriate for the whole situation. He thought that he could come as he was. Now, now, now how does this apply to us? We just sang to him, Jesus, thy blood and righteousness, my beauty are my glorious dress. How do you get to heaven? Is it come as you are, or don't come at all, from the 80s song, come as you are, or don't come at all? No. God wants you to be dressed in a certain way, because heaven is perfection, and righteousness, and holiness. And God cannot live with any imperfection or sin, and so he gives us what he requires. The only thing is that it costs someone dearly. It costs Jesus dearly to give us the clothes that we needed to get into God's heavenly banquet. We talk about the great exchange sometimes, that Jesus gives us his perfection for our shabby, terrible clothes. We get the perfection that Jesus gives us, that he lived with, that he died with, Jesus gets our sins, he takes those to the cross. And it, again, cost him dearly because in the hymn that we'll sing in a few minutes, God was estranged from God. What does that mean? Jesus, God, was estranged from his own Heavenly Father. Why? Because Jesus was experiencing hell. Literally, hell for you and me. Because that's what our sins deserve. Jesus was taking that because he did not want to see us take that on our own. He wanted us to be with him in heaven someday. That's why we sing, Jesus, your blood and 
your righteousness. That's my glory expressed. That's my righteousness. This parable is all about God's grace as so many other parables are all about God's grace. God offers us everything. God pays for everything. He offers it to us for how much? Free. That's called grace. He doesn't charge us for anything that he is going to give us. Here, here's the question. What are you doing with your salvation? How, how are you treating your salvation? Is it still the treasure that God wants it to be for you? Do you treasure the fact that someday, whenever God wills, he is going to invite you personally to his wedding banquet and he's going to give you a first-hand and great invitation. It's free. It's yours. Come to the wedding banquet. Are we treating that as the treasure that it is? Or are we thinking that, you know what, I can take it or leave it. Right. Thanks. No thanks, God. I've got other plans for eternity. The plans that he has for eternity are not plans that you want to go through. This is the invitation. You have been invited by God to heaven. You know what that invitation entails. God's word is replete with all kinds of descriptions of heaven and how wonderful it's going to be. You've been given what you need to get into the banquet hall, to get into the heaven's gates. Clothes of Christ's righteousness, the feast is ready. By faith in Jesus, accept the invitation. Come to God's heavenly feast. Amen. God, which goes beyond our understanding, will guard and keep your hearts and your minds in the true faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We confess our Christian faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, the Maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, His only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell.
Eternal God and Father, we humbly ask that you would also show your great mercy and your compassion to Jay German, who is coming home this weekend under hospice care. As he passes through the valley of the shadow of death in your timetable, comfort him with your unfailing promises that you will always be with him, that he never be overcome by fear. Spirit, spare him extreme physical pain. Encourage him and his loved ones with the sure hope of heavenly glory that awaits all people who trust in Jesus for deliverance. Into your hands we commit him, O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Gracious Father, we also pray boldly as Jesus taught, with confidence that you will hear us, and with the faith that you will respond for our welfare. Amen. Amen.
out the Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep us strong in your grace and truth. Protect and comfort us in all temptation. And bestow on us your saving peace. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come.
not this coming week, but the following week we have a work day schedule. Our building grounds person has scheduled a lot of things going on. And, and they're not just the normal outdoor stuff. There's some, some bigger projects that are gonna take some, some hands to do and some strong backs to accomplish. So that means that there's gonna be a lot of regular stuff that needs um, hands, that need hands and, and strong backs to do. Raking, um, trimming of branches, um, burning leaves, all kinds of that stuff. The, the, the upkeep of the cemetery that we do on a, on a twice a year basis. So a lot of, lots of hands would be needed for that. If you can, um, spare a couple of hours on October 28th, this is Saturday morning. That would be greatly appreciated because we're going to be spread thin, I think, with uh, the other projects that have been planned. So, and, and inside too, there's lots and lots of inside projects that need to be done. Um, they don't get cleaned on a, on a weekly basis. So, so please join us on that 28th if you can. Um, all the other things are in your in your bulletin. Read them for yourself. God's blessings on your week.